Okay, welcome back. In this video, we will discuss chapter six, uh, the skeletal system, uh, the framework. A brief introduction uh, to the chapter. Uh, the skeletal system will provide uh, support and allows us to move. Uh, muscles have to have uh, some place to attach to in order for them to help us move. The bones that, are, that make up the skeleton are also there to protect the internal organs, such as the heart and the lungs and uh, the brain and so on. They produce uh, the various blood cells, which we'll talk about in a future chapter, and act as a storage unit for uh, various minerals and types of fat. Now there are approximately 206 bones in the typical adult skeleton, and the skeletal system is not only just the bones themselves, but it's also the different types of cartilages, different types of ligaments, and the different uh, joints. All those together make up the skeletal system, so it's not just the bones. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter uh, be able to describe the functions of the skeletal system, be able to identify and describe the anatomy and physiology of bone, and be able to locate and describe the various bones within the body. Also be able to differentiate between bone and cartilage, uh, ligaments, and tendons. Be able to locate and describe the various joints and the different uh, joint types and the types of movement in the body. And also be able to explain some common diseases and disorders of the skeletal system. All right, we'll start off talking about uh, bones. Bones are the primary components of the skeletal system. And even though they are composed of non-living materials such as calcium and phosphorus uh, and other minerals, bones are actually a very dynamic tissue. They are a living tissue. They're constantly being built up and being uh, broken down to be used by the body. So it's not a, a static uh, structure. It is a very dynamic structure. And you will lose approximately 15 to 20 percent of your skeleton every year. So the skeleton that you have in your body right now will, will be completely replaced within the next seven to ten years. And the word skeleton actually comes from a Greek word which means uh, dried up body. There are some general bone classifications. Uh, bones can be classified by their overall shape. Uh, you have long bones and like the name you know, implies they are longer than they are wide such as in the arms and the bones in the legs. Uh, short bones, they are roughly equal in length and width. They're shaped almost like a cube. You'll find these bones in the wrist and in uh, the ankles. Uh, some bones are classified as uh, flat bones. These are thinner and very uh, broad and plate-like. They can be flat or they can be curved. You'll find these in uh, the flat part of the skull, the ribs and the sternum, uh, the breastbone. Those are all considered to be flat bones. And there are other bones that don't really fall into any of these other categories. They are this odd shape. They are irregular bones. They, they're just, they look irregular. They just look weird, such as uh, the vertebrae, uh, your backbones, and the bones that are in uh, the hips. They don't fall under long or short or flat. They just look strange, so they are classified as irregular. All right, here are some uh, examples of the various types of bones. I see the long bone. Uh, the, the humerus, which is the upper arm, it was longer than it is wide. Uh, the short bone, this is the uh, the ankle bone of the foot. This is the ankle, and it's highlighted in this blue. It's roughly the same length and width, so it is a short bone. Flat bone, the scapula or the shoulder blade, you know, thin on this edge and very flat and broad-like. So that'd be an example of a, a flat bone. Irregular, such as the vertebrae, uh, the bones of uh, the spinal column. Right, now we'll move into uh, the anatomy of bone. Uh, first, we'll start off with the the outermost lining, the periosteum. This is a very tough, very strong uh, layer of connective tissue that will cover the entire outside wrapping of the bone. It's where you'll find the uh, blood vessels, which will transport blood and nutrients uh, to nurture the bone for bone for bone growth. Also, you'll have uh, the lymph vessels and the nerves found here. Uh, this will act as an anchor point for ligaments and tendons. We'll focus mostly on a typical long bone when it comes to these uh, features. Uh, the next two, uh, the epiphysis and diaphysis. The epiphysis is the end of a bone. So, the, so think of e for, uh, e for end and E for epiphysis. So those are the ends. And then the longer part in the middle, the shaft of the long bone, it's called the diaphysis. Within the diaphysis, you'll find a, a hollow region called a medullary cavity or a medullary uh, canal. And this acts as a storage area for the bone marrow. 
Now the bone marrow, there are two different types, uh, red and yellow. Uh, the red marrow will make blood cells, and the yellow marrow is very high in fat content. And in an, an emergency situation, this fat found here can be converted into red marrow. As so here's a, a typical long bone here. This would be the, uh, the humerus or the upper arm bone here. So the ends here and here are the epiphysis or epiphyses to be plural. E for epiphysis, E for end. So both ends here. Then the, the shaft of that long bone, the diaphysis here. So we're going to zoom in on this section here. Of course, the periosteum is pulled back here, like you're turning a page uh, within a book. That's the, the connective tissue that wraps around the entire bone. That's where you find blood vessels and uh, lymphatic vessels and nerves and so on. As inner uh, hollow chamber that runs the length of the long bone from here to here. That'd be the uh, medullary cavity. And then inside that cavity, you'll find the uh, bone marrow. Now, a bone will have uh, two different types of tissue depending on what its function is and where it's found. Uh, the first one will be a uh, compact bone, a very tense, very hard tissue that's found in the shaft of the long bones and the outer layer of some other bones. So this is very, very tightly compacted material that allows for uh, a great deal of strength. So think of the tiles, say, on a, a kitchen floor, for example. They're lined up you know, end to end to end. There's no spaces in between them. So this allows for an incredible amount of strength, which is what you want for long bones. And these are found within the, the shaft of the long bone. Now this material is formed in cylindrical units called uh, haversion systems or osteons. The prefix osteo is always a reference to bones. Osteons are a, a bone building center. Now each of these units, these osteons or haversion systems, either term is correct. It just depends on what term you are choosing to use. But for this chapter we will reference them as osteons. So each of these osteons you'll find mature bone cells, osteocytes. Again, osteo means bone, and site always means a cell or mature cell. And you have these bone cells will form concentric circles uh, around a centralized blood vessel. It looks almost like a, a target logo or a bullseye logo. And the area around these osteocytes are filled with uh, calcium, protein fibers, and other minerals. Now these osteons will run parallel to one another, and the blood vessels will connect to each other laterally to make sure that the tissue is getting enough nutrients because this is living tissue. It has to have some way to receive oxygen and get rid of waste. All right, that compact bone is found in the shaft of the long bones. The ends of the long bones, the epiphysis, you'll find what's called spongy bone. It's also called trabecular bone or cancellous bone. Now, these are a type of bone that's going to be arranged in uh, bars or bony plates called trabeculae. That's why it's called trabecular bone. Now within these plates you'll find irregularly shaped holes to make this area of the bone lighter in weight and more and provide more space for red bone marrow, which is the tissue that will produce red blood cells. Now these holes give it the appearance of a kitchen sponge. That's why it's called spongy bone. It literally looks like a sponge you would use to clean your sink. And so first we'll zoom in on the diaphysis here. And each of these cylindrical units Here's one that's pulled out already. That whole thing is an osteon. So, so there would be one. There's one that's not pulled out. There's one. There's one. So the shaft of the long bone, the compact bone, is nothing more than these cylinder-shaped units lined up end to end to end, giving the long bones an incredible amount of strength. And then down here, you see the trabeculae or the spongy bone. It looks very porous. It looks like a sponge. Right, next, we'll talk about the surface structure of bones. Uh, a bone is not perfectly smooth at all. There are a variety of bumps and ridges and projections and depressions, and each of those has their own uh, unique name for them. And being able to remember what those terms mean will make remembering what these features are called a lot, lot easier. These projections will act as points of attachment for various muscles and ligaments and or tendons. And the grooves and depressions act as a pathway for nerves and blood vessels. 
Now the projecting structures and depressions uh, also work together to form an articulation or forming a joint such as the ball and socket joint within the hip. All right, here are some very common uh, bone features. Uh, the first group, the projecting structures and processes. And these terms, just like the prefixes we've talked about, just like the suffixes we talked about, their meanings never change. So for example, condyle. A condyle always means a large, a large rounded knob, usually forming a joint with another bone. And a good example of that is the occipital condyle. If you feel on the back of your head, right at the top of the neck, the bumps that you feel right toward the back of the head, you, you feel two large bumps. Those are the occipital condyles because they're found on the occipital bone of the skull. So a condyle always means that large rounded knob. No, a spine always means a sharp projection. No, a tubercle always means a small knob-like projection. So knowing what these terms reference helps tremendously being able to identify these various features in bones. For the depressions and openings, see a sinus always means a hollow area. A fossa always means a, a shallow depression or a, a groove. A foramen always means a, a passageway through, uh, through a bone where blood vessels and nerves pass through. Such as the, the base of the skull is a very large hole. It's called the foramen magnum. Magnum means large, so foramen magnum literally means large hole, and that's where the top of the sp uh, spinal cord enters the brain. All right, next, we'll talk about uh, bone growth and repair. Uh, the ossification or osteogenesis is the formation of bone in the body. Again, osteo means bone, and the genesis means the formation of or the cre the creation of. So osteogenesis, the creation of bone. Now, bones will grow uh, longitudinally. To help lengthen, so you get taller, and then horizontally or wider and thicker to allow more uh, efficient support for the body weight. So not only do bones grow uh, vertically to make you taller, but they also grow uh, laterally also to give you strength. Now there are various uh, cell types that are involved with bone formation and bone growth. You have osteoprogenitor cells, you have osteoblast, osteocytes, and osteoclast. And they're very common to get backwards, especially osteoblast and osteoclast tend to get confused quite often. We'll talk about uh, briefly what each of these types do. The first one, osteoprogenitor cells. These are non-specialized cells that are found in the periosteum, the endosteum, which is the innermost lining of the medullary cavity, and then the within the central canal of the compact bones. And these can turn into other types of cells as needed. So these are really just non-specialized cells that haven't been specialized into one of the other three types just yet. Next you have osteoblast. These are cells that actually form the bones. These are the ones that will build up bone. So B for blast and B for build up is a good way to think about it. Now these will, will be derived from the non-specialized osteoprogenitor cells. And these are bone cells that will secrete a matrix of calcium and other minerals that give bone its very typical characteristics. Right. Uh, next type, osteocytes. These are the mature bone cells we talked about earlier. These will start off as osteoblasts, but then these osteoblasts will uh, surround themselves with a matrix of calcium, will help them mature into a full-fledged uh, bone cell, an osteocyte. So osteoblasts, once they lay down their the calcium rings around themselves, turn into osteocytes. And the next one, osteoclast. These are are believed to be originated from a monocyte, which is a type of white blood cell. And their job is to tear down bone mineral and help move material into the blood, such as calcium and, and phosphate. I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the video that bone is a very living, dynamic tissue. It's constantly being built up and being broken down to be used by the body. Now, the osteoblast will help build up the bone the osteoclast will help tear it down. Because sometimes your body needs more calcium. It needs more phosphorus. It needs minerals that are stored within bone. So that's why bones are considered to be a living tissue. All right, now we'll talk about uh, actual bro or bone growth. Uh, bone growth and development. Uh, the growth and development of bone will actually begin within the womb through a process called uh, intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Now, intramembranous ossification happens when you have 
a bone developing between two sheets of connective tissue that are connected. This is how the bones of the skull form. That's why with a newborn you have that soft spot, that fontanelle on top of the head, because that, that layer or that space has not been covered with bone quite yet. Now the cells from this connective tissue will turn into osteoblast and will lay down their matrix of calcium and phosphorus, basically building up the bone, filling in the gaps between the two sheets of connective tissue. And this will create compact bone over a surface of spongy bone. Now once that matrix surrounds the osteoblast, that's when they turn into mature cells, osteocytes. This is how bones like the bones of the skull form. Now the majority of the bones form through a process called endochondral ossification. This is where you have a shaped cartilage that is being replaced by bone. What you have is uh, periosteum will cover the, the limbs as the fetus develops, which all start off as hyaline cartilage. And then that hyaline cartilage will begin to be replaced by bone as that cartilage gets broken down. And the osteoblast will come into the region and create spongy bone in an area that is called the primary ossification center. This is how bones will get uh, longer in length. In addition to that, you have other osteoblasts that will, will begin to form uh, the compact bone under the periosteum in the, the shaft of that soon-to-be long bone. And you also have osteoclasts breaking down spongy bone of the diaphysis to create the medullary cavity. After a uh, baby is born, the method on how that baby gets taller is due to the uh, location in these bones called the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. The epiphysis on long bones will continue to grow. That's how you get a baby getting taller. You know, the legs get longer and the arms get longer. And what's happening is there's a thin band of cartilage that's formed between the primary and secondary ossification centers. And that cartilage gets replaced slowly by bone. As it happens, the bone gets longer. And this epiphyseal plate will exist as long as a bone is needed to get wider and get longer. This is a temporary type of tissue though. The epiphyseal plate will basically turn completely into bone by the time we're all in our early 20s. For women it's about 19 to 20, for males it's about 21 approximately. So this is something that is not you know, there forever. And how often we grow and how quickly we grow is all controlled by various hormones which we'll talk about in a future video. All right, here we have the a summary of the endochondral ossification. We can assume this would be the say the upper arm bone of say a fetus. This light blue is, is because it's a type of cartilage. What you have is bone growth will start here in the middle of what will be you know, the baby's upper arm. From here, bone will be replaced on top of the cartilage, replacing that cartilage. From here, this part grows upward. And from here, this part grows downward. So as that's happening, you get a carving out form of the, uh, the inner hollow chamber, that medullary cavity. So again, this is growing this way. That's growing this way. That's how the bone is getting longer. So when you are completed, you have a thin band. You have the amount of cartilage that's between the end of the long bone and the shaft long bone getting progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is the area of actual bone growth right here and right here. But it eventually gets less and less and less, and then it's fully replaced or fully ossified by bone around the early 20s. At that point, you cannot grow any taller no matter what you do. Once you have that band of active growth gone, you can't do anything to replace it. All right, next we'll talk about uh, pathology connection and osteoporosis. Now, as we age, the breakdown of bone formation will be greater than the formation of new bone cells, causing the bone mass to get gradually less and less and less. Remember we talked about how there's a constant building up of bone and a constant tearing down of bone. Well, as we get older, more gets torn down compared to the amount that gets you know, built up. So bones will get you know, progressively uh, less and less dense. So because of this, bones will become uh, much weaker and uh, much lighter. And then the the areas of the spongy bone become more prominent, more filled with uh, the spaces, which means the bone is very, very weak or brittle, which means it's very prone to being uh, broken. And this is particularly true with women who are uh, postmenopausal, and usually will happen in uh, bones that carry 
an awful lot of weight, say, for for example, the hip. It's very common for a woman who's postmenopausal to break a hip with little to no effort. It's because it's under so much pressure all the time from standing up, and as that hip bone gets weaker and weaker, it's more prone to just break. Now, this loss of bone mass can be slowed down by some various activities, such as uh, changes in your diet, adding more calcium, adding more vitamin D, adding more fluoride. Right, other ways to uh, slow down the uh, loss of bone density, uh, stopping smoking or uh, decreasing the amount of caffeine that you consume, and also uh, doing weight-bearing and impact forms of exercise. When you're doing exercises that are weight-bearing, not only are you building up muscle and muscle strength, you're also building up bone and bone strength as well. Here's a good illustration of a regular healthy bone here on the left. You see how it looks like a typical you know, kitchen sponge, like a typical kitchen sponge with the spongy bone. But as we get older and more bone tissue gets torn down as opposed to being built up, you have these large spaces form all throughout the long bones, which makes it very brittle, very weak. So when you have more spaces like this, the bone becomes uh, much lighter, much weaker, and much more prone to being broken because there's no support structure there to help bear the weight that it's under. All right, now we'll move on to uh, cartilage. This is a special form of dense connective tissue that can withstand a, a good amount of flexing and tension and twisting and pressure. Now some various uh, types of cartilage are flexible, like in the, the point of your nose and on the ears. And cartilage will also make uh, connections between bones very flexible, such as the, uh, the sternum or the breastbone and the ribs, allowing the chest to you know, uh, expand as you take a deep breath. You have some types of cartilage that will act as a cushion in between bones, such as the articular cartilage found on the ends of long bones. It will act as a shock absorber. This will prevent bones from grinding against each other when you move. You also find these in between, uh, in between the vertebrae of the uh, of the backbone. Now, at places like this, you'll find a small sac called the bursa, which helps secrete a a lubricant, a fluid called synovial fluid, and this helps to protect the bones so they don't wear down and produce uh, less friction with one another. And these joints, or these, if these joints didn't have this type of synovial fluid, the bones would rub up rub against each other a lot more often, it would break down much, much quicker, much, much faster, which would lead to uh, arthritis or osteoarthritis. Okay, here's an example of you know, two bones here forming an articulation or a joint. This whole thing is wrapped by different types of uh, membranes and a specialized capsule, and the fluid in between these two bones is filled with synovial fluid. That's how these bones can bend over one another and not hurt each other. This is a an example of a, a knee joint. This would be the, the thigh bone or the femur. That'd be the shin bone, uh, the tibia. So the space in between there is filled with uh, synovial fluid. Right, now we'll talk about joints and ligaments. When you have two or more uh, bones joining together, they form a joint, or the formal name is articulation. Now articulating joints are held together, but they are still movable. And this is done by connective tissue called a ligament. Now ligaments are going to be very tough, very strong, uh, whitish bands of connective tissue that connect bone to bone. And this can withstand pretty heavy stress. Now tendons are cord-like uh, pieces of connective tissue that attach muscle to bone. So those two are often confused with one another. But ligaments go bone to bone, tendons go muscle to bone. A good example of, the, of a tendon that most people would be aware of is the Achilles tendon is on the, the back of your lower leg. It attaches the, the calf muscle, the gastrocnemius, to the back of your heel, the calcaneus. So that's, attacked, that's attaching a muscle to a bone as a tendon. All right, next we'll talk about different types of synovial joints. Uh, synovial joints are the most common of the, the joints we have in our body and also the most complex of the types of joints we have. Uh, the first kind uh, is a pivot joint. You have a, a turnstile movement in the neck and also in the forearm and only they can rotate. Uh, so you have a ball and socket joint, such as in the hip and in uh, the shoulder. You have the most range of motion for this type of joint, because you also have rotation. You have a hinge joint, where you have an opening and closing uh, of movement, such as in the elbows and in the knees, like the hinge on a door frame. It can only go in that one plane of motion. You know, it can't go in anything else. It just opens and closes. Uh, you also have a gliding joint, 
which you will find in the wrist and in the ankles. This will provide for a sliding uh, back and forth movement, also also called a plane joint, uh, a saddle joint. It's shaped like a saddle that you would put on a horse. It's uh, found within the thumb, and it can rock up and down and also side to side. An ellipsoidal or a condyloid or condylar joint provide two axes of motion. It's like combining the joint between the wrist and the forearm, also with the, the hinge of the knuckles of your fingers. I hear those various locations. The ball and socket that most people are familiar with. The ball and socket. You know, you have a ball-shaped part of one bone fitting into the socket or the cup section of another bone. That is your shoulder. A saddle found in the thumb. It's actually shaped like a saddle right there. A gliding or plane. You know, going in those directions and those directions. The bones are literally gliding by one another. Uh, ellipsoidal or condylar, uh, such as uh, in the wrist. Hinge, you know, like the hinge of a door frame and the elbow. You know, it just opens and closes. It's the only plane of motion it can do. And then uh, pivot, where you allow for uh, rotation. That's how the bones of the forearm are able to rotate over one another. All right, now we'll move on to the different classifications of movement. And a lot of these will be, will have an opposite type of movement to them. So the first two, flexion and extension. Uh, flexion is when you're bending a joint and decreasing the angle between the bones that are involved. So if you are to flex your, your bicep muscle, you know, flexing your arm, the angle between the bone, the bone of your upper arm and your bones of your lower arm are getting less and less. They are becoming decreased because they're getting closer together. So that's when you're flexing something. The opposite of that would be extension. If you were to straighten out that arm, where it's completely you know, flat out, you are increasing the angle between the bones of the lower arm and the bones of the upper arm. So flexing is when you're say, flexing your, your muscles. Extension is when you are extending or laying out flat the arm. Uh, the next two involve uh, the feet, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Uh, the word plantar is reference to the bottom of the foot. So when you are, so plantar flexion is when you are pointing your toes downward so you are like standing on your toes so like a like a ballerina would be because you are flexing the, the bottom part of your foot opposite of that would be dorsiflexion when you're bending the top of your foot toward your shin so it's when you're standing on your heels see hyperextension is when the joint is forced beyond its its normal point you know if you lay your arm flat out that's fully extended as it should go if you keep keep extending it, then you have a hyperextension. If you hyperextend your knee, it goes further back than it should. Because hyper always means beyond or above normal. The next two, are very often confused with one another, because they're only different by one letter. Abduction and adduction. For abduction, A-B, you're moving away from the body's midline. And the opposite of that would be adduction, going toward the midline. And the way to keep this straight, even though it's a horrible way to think about it, but it is a, a good illustration. If someone is abducted from their home, they're being taken away from their home. So abduction going away from the midline. The, the next two also involve uh, the feet. Uh, inversion and eversion. Inversion, you're turning your foot inward toward the other foot. So inversion, turning your foot in. Then eversion, eversion, turning your foot outward or laterally. Let's see, uh, supination. And pronation involving the hand and the palm. Supination, your palm will be up. So when you're in the standard anatomical position, when your palms are facing out, that is in the supine position or supinated position. Uh, pronation, you're putting your palm down. Anytime that you are in a prone position, you are face down. So pronation is when your palms are facing downward. Uh, circumduction, you are being able to move in a circular path. So in a when an, an explorer circumnavigates, yeah, circum is always a reference to a circle or circular. Uh, protraction, moving a body part forward. Uh, retraction, moving a body part backward. So pro means forward, re means back. And then rotation, when a bone will spin on its axis. Here's a summary of, of all these terms. So over here with the leg, when the leg is being bent, the bones, or the angle of the bones between the lower leg 
and the upper leg are getting decreased. So that's flexion. When you extend the leg, the angles between here and here, say 180 degrees, the number of degrees is getting higher. So that's extension. See, inversion, eversion, inversion, turning your foot inward toward the midline or immediately, eversion, turning your foot outward or eversion, rotation, you know, just spinning around your head, rotating, circumduction, being able to move in a circle. In this image, the top of the foot is turning toward the shin, that'd be dorsiflexion. If this foot were flexing this way, then it'd be plantar flexion. Flexion, extension, and hyperextension goes beyond what it should. Uh, palm down, pronation, palm up, supination, uh, pulling the jaw forward, moving the body part forward, protraction, and pulling it back, retraction. And the last two up here, ab and adduction, going away from the midline, ab, ab, abduction, going toward the midline, adduction. All right, now we'll talk about another uh, pathology connection with some common joint disorders. The first one, uh, types of arthritis. Now you have osteoarthritis, which is where a joint really just you know, wears out. You know, it's a certain age and a certain wear and tear on the joint is just going to get it's going to get worn down. And some common risk factors: you know, trauma, aging, obesity, uh, sports injuries, uh, repetitive motion. All that can is grind down a any kind of joint. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis. This is a, this is an autoimmune condition where the connective tissue and joints are basically being attacked by your own your own body's immune system. All right, another type of arthritis is septic arthritis. This is where you get an infection within the joint, and then you become septic. Uh, next type, uh, gout. This is the body's uh, decreased ability to control the amount of uric acid that's produced or its elimination from the body. So whenever you get high levels of uric acid in the blood, they start to crystallize and are deposited within connective tissue. That's when you get gout. Right. You can also have uh, inflammation of various structures near a joint, such as uh, bursitis, inflammation of one or more of the those little pads that produce the synovial fluid, the bursa. So anytime you see itis, as always a reference to inflammation of. So bursitis, inflammation of the bursa. Uh, tendonitis, inflammation of a tendon. Now these can be caused by congenital defects, uh, skeletal misalignments, uh, repetitive motion, uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, sports activity, gout, uh, some common treatments for these. You know, rest, uh, analgesics or pain relievers, uh, application of cold and moist heat, corticosteroid injections. Another common one, a torn rotator cuff. Uh, this is common for uh, athletes such as uh, baseball players like pitchers or uh, quarterbacks in American football. Now, the rotator cuff is a group of muscles that hold the head of the humerus, the upper arm, into the scapula or the shoulder blade. So activities that stress this shoulder can cause these tendons to uh, attach the rotator cuff to tear, such as you know, throwing a baseball, throwing a football. You know, these constant repetitive motions eventually tear down these tendons. And treatment for this type of uh, condition often involves surgery. Uh, a sprain, this is an uh, injury to a ligament in the joint. And a common way to uh, treat this is called RICE, R-I-C-E. That stands for rest, ice, 48 hours, uh, compression of the injury with a, like an ace bandage or an elastic wrap, and then elevation of that sprained area above the heart. So R-I-C-E, RICE. You also have a joint dislocation where the bones are no longer uh, lined up properly. Uh, you're going to have a closed reduction. This is where you can apply gentle pressure to put the joint back where it should be or put the bones back where they should be. Arthroscopy this is a procedure that's used to diagnose and treat various types of joint injuries. And you do this with, with what's called an arthroscope. This is a snake-like instrument that has a very long flexible tube that has a light on the end of it and an eyepiece on the other. All right, now we'll move into general classifications of the skeleton. And the skeleton falls under two main categories, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is the bones of the, the thorax, uh, the spinal column, the hyoid bone, uh, the bones of the middle ear and the skull. It's basically your chest, uh, your ribs, uh, skull, vertebral column, 
and this will protect about 80 bones. Everything else that's included with the arms and the legs. Uh, your arms and the legs are considered or are called appendages, so they're classified under the appendicular skeleton. So the arms, legs, uh, shoulder girdles, uh, hips, these total about 126 of the bones. And then half of the bones in your body are found just within your hands and your feet. It's a standard image of a, a common skeleton. So where the axial skeleton would be the skull, the bones of the middle ear, the ossicles there, uh, the hyoid bone, which is just under the, under the chin here, uh, the sternum, the rib cage, and then the vertebral column. Everything else will be the appendicular. So the arms, the shoulder girdles, the hips, and the legs. All those will be considered the appendicular skeleton. Right, now move on to the uh, the human skull. Of course, we'll protect and house the, uh, the brain. It has multiple openings for different sensory functions, such as the the eyes and the ears and the nose. Also has the mouth. A common passageway for both the respiratory system and the digestive system. You, know, you breathe in air, that will be directed toward the lungs. And then when you eat your food, that is directed toward the stomach. And also we'll have uh, some fibrous cartilage that's found in the skull that allows for some flexibility with bones around the brain. Not much, but some. There's the basic bones of the skull. The ones that are in the one that's in front is the frontal bone. The, the flat bones on the side of the head on either side, the parietals. Uh, temporal by your temples occipital is the bone in the back of the head this is a close-up on the, the the jaw your lower jaw the mandible the upper part of your mouth maxilla and this of course is nowhere near all of the details all the bones within the skull itself that would be difficult to put just on one image here this is a good generic illustration of the various bones of the of the skull if you were to take a skull and flip it upside down you can see the uh, some of the bones we talked about already from a different uh, perspective. Here's the foramen magnum I mentioned earlier. It's this opening. Remember, foramen means passageway through a bone, and magnum means large. This is where the spinal cord enters the brain through this opening here. Again, another image from another uh, perspective. Frontal bone, uh, parietal, which would be on either side there and there, just behind this image. The orbits where you find the eyes, uh, nasal bones here, upper part of the mouth, maxilla, and that color, and the lower jaw, the mandible, They're just name you know, a few of the many, many features. Our next talk about the, uh, the thorax. This is what will form the uh, thoracic cage that provides support and protection for the heart and the lungs and some of the uh, larger uh, blood vessels, like the aorta. Uh, this cage is flexible to allow for a movement for uh, respiration, especially for when you take a deep breath, to allow for your lungs to include for a larger volume. The breastbone or the sternum is the location for uh, chest compressions where you're doing CPR. This will compress the heart between uh, the sternum, you know, just above it, and the bones of the vertebrae just behind it. Okay, here's an illustration of the, uh, the thorax, the sternum, or the breastbone here in the middle. Of course, all the ribs that are attached. The first seven pairs of ribs are the true ribs. The next three pairs are called false ribs. Then the last two pairs are called uh, floating ribs. All right, next we'll move on to the spinal column, often called the uh, vertebral column. This is the, uh, the superhighway of information uh, traveling to and then from uh, the, the central nervous system. Now the individual bones, or the vertebrae, are numbered and classified according to the body region uh, that they're found in. Uh, the first seven vertebrae are the cervical vertebrae. The cervical is reference to neck. Uh, the next 12 are the thoracic vertebrae. They're, they go with the thoracic uh, cavity in the body. Uh, the next five are the lumbar vertebrae. They are in the lower back. The next group is uh, the sacral vertebrae. These are, these are really five fused together vertebrae in one big unit called the sacrum. And the very, very tail end of this will be the uh, tailbone, or also called the coccyx. These are three to five very small bones also that are fused together. Okay, so again, here's the vertebral column, or spinal column. First seven, cervical, in this green color. Uh, the next 12 are thoracic. And then the next 
uh, 5 or lumbar. This whole unit is the sacrum. And the very, very tail end of this, the tailbone, the coccyx. Now, at birth, the uh, vertebral column is concave uh, to the front, like a like the fetal position. It's called the primary curvature. Now, this curvature will change as the infant learns to hold its head up more consistently, starts to walk, starts to crawl, so it will curve in the opposite direction. From two years of age and then onward, we'll develop a, a secondary curvature in the neck, the primary curvature in the upper back, uh, a secondary curvature in the lower back, and a primary curvature in the uh, mid-buttocks region. So going back to this image here, a secondary curve here at the neck region, primary curvature at the thoracic, another secondary curve in the lower back in the lumbar region, and then another primary curvature in the mid-buttock or the sacral region. All right, next we'll talk about another pathology connection, uh, so spinal column uh, abnormalities. Uh, the first one, a herniated disc. This is when you have the, the soft central part of the inner vertebral disc that is forced or protruded through the outer covering. So the in between the vertebrae is a, a padding, a shock absorber of, of a type of cartilage, a fibro cartilage. If that gets pushed outward where it shouldn't be, that can cause a lot of pain. This can uh, easily press on the root of a spinal nerve. Now some of these symptoms, uh, low back pain, radiating, radiating pain down the sciatic nerve, down uh, to the buttocks, uh, the leg and then the foot on one side. There are some abnormal uh, curvatures of the spine. Uh, the first one, uh, kyphosis. The upper portion of the spinal column will have a uh, posterior curve, which is will result in a humpback or a hunchback look. So the opposite of that would be uh, lordosis. You have the anterior curvature of the lower back. It's often called a sway back. Uh, scoliosis, a lateral, a meaning left to right curvature of the spine. Now, key to successful successful treatment is early detection. Now, some spinal column corrections can be done through exercise, uh, good nutrition, and weight control, or you may need bracing, uh, corrective shoes, so that the legs are of equal length, or uh, surgery may also may also be an option. Here's a image of all three of these: uh, kyphosis where you have a humpback or a hunchback look because the top part is more curved uh, posteriorly. Uh, the swayback or the lordosis, the more anterior curve. So you have this curving much further toward the front. And the scoliosis, a left and right zigzag curvature. And now we'll move on to the upper and lower extremities. This is the appendicular region because you are including the appendages, the arms and legs. Now these areas will perform most of the body movements, uh, making them more vulnerable to sports-related injuries. You know, the more you use something, the more likely it is to uh, break down or get hurt. Now the uh, pelvic girdle is going to be different in females than it would be in males. And the reason why you have this is because women are the ones that will you know, carry a, a newborn. They will go through childbirth and males don't. So structurally, the female pelvic girdle will be different than the male pelvic girdle. The female girdle will actually have a, a greater pubic angle, you know, a wider base to allow for you know, childbirth. And also this this widened area will also offer greater support you know, to carry the extra weight of that child. This is how you're able to distinguish just by looking at a pelvis if that person was male or female, just by the, uh, the pubic angle. And then the pelvis will have uh, three bones that make it up. You have the ilium, ischium, and pubis. Because if you're looking at the, the pelvic girdle, it'll be here and here, obviously. The ilium will be the broad, f uh, flat part here, the, the winged part of it. The ischium will be right about here. And then the pubis will be more toward the pubic region. And then here you have a comparison side by side of male versus female uh, pelvic girdles. And a much wider angle here, the pubic angle between, it's the angle between these two bones here. So for females it's much wider compared to males, which is what you would need if you're going to carry a child and deliver a child. Now we'll go on to another pathology connection, uh, bone fractures and healing. Or a fracture is the term for any break in a bone. So when you break a bone you have a fracture. A fracture is just a, a formal name for a, a broken bone. There are multiple types of fractures. 
Uh, you have a simple closed fracture. This is where you have a bone that's broken but without puncture to the skin. It's broken but the skin remains closed. A compound or open fracture. You have a fracture where the bone is actually broken through the skin. So the skin has been ripped open. You actually see the bone protruding through. Uh, hairline fractures. Very fine fractures that does not completely break or displace the bone. And if you look at this on an x-ray, it looks like a hair has been placed on the image of the bone. That's why it's called a hairline fraction. Uh, some other types, you have uh, green stick fractures. These are an incomplete break, uh, more common to children. Then uh, comminuted fractures, where the bone has been fragmented or splintered in many pieces. Now compound or open fractures can be incredibly difficult to deal with because then you have deep tissue potentially is exposed to uh, bacteria once the bone has already been uh, set back in place. So the chance for infection will be a lot higher whenever you have whenever you have a compound or an open fracture because you're having the internal, internal environment being exposed to the external environment. And whenever you have that, it's always going to increase the risk for any kind of infection. Now bones can take several weeks to heal. Of course, it depends on what bone is broken and what type of fracture you have. It can only heal normally if the ends of the bones are touching each other. If the bones are not touching each other or not aligned very well, the bones have to be uh, reduced or have to be set. And whenever you have a fracture in a longer bone, like in the leg, for example, traction has to be used in order to set the bones and align the bones correctly. All right, now we'll talk about the bone healing in our pathology connection. In the first few hours after an injury, you have a, a blood clot that forms around the broken bone. It's called the hematoma. They, you also have inflammation uh, start, start to set in. For the next three to four weeks after this, you have a, a soft callus that forms that will replace that hematoma and the bridging the gap between the broken ends of the bone. And the soft callus will start as hyaline cartilage and that will eventually get replaced by bone cells. So laying down the matrix to form more bone to connect the two ends of the bones together. So at that point you have capillaries uh, invade that site. In order to bring blood to that injured site you have to have blood vessels. So once these capillaries start to form, that's when you're able to vascularize that area. And that will help increase the healing process. And after this, from about week 4 to about week 12, and after the initial injury, uh, the callus will become bony. They have a bony callus forming, you know, eliminating that uh, soft callus. And what will usually happen is this bony callus will have excess bone. So you have to have a remodeling done. So you basically have to trim down to the bone what you need and get rid of the excess material that you don't need. And that process is called remodeling. And that's necessary after that bony callus forms so it can match both ends of the broken bone together correctly. Right, here are some uh, images of the common types of uh, fractures. Uh, comminuted fracture, where you can see multiple pieces here. A simple uh, transverse fracture of the tibia is the the main shin bone, you see the break here and also here very clearly. That's a simple fracture because it's not breaking through the skin. This is a closed fracture. The opposite of that would be an open fracture or a compound fracture. Of course, that should not look like that at all. That should be within, underneath the skin. So that's a, a compound fracture of the wrist. We have the bone of the forearm protruding through the skin. So something like this is at a much higher risk for infection because it is exposed to the external world. A displaced fracture of the distal radius. The radius is the bone in the uh, lower forearm that goes to the thumb. If displaced, it means it's not placed correctly. You can see how it doesn't look right right there. All right, now move on to maintaining uh, good bone health. Now we all lose some amount of bone mass as we get older. That is a natural process of aging. It can be slowed down based on a healthy lifestyle. You know, having you know, good amounts of calcium within your diet, you know, exercise, especially you know, weight-bearing exercise, uh, so staying active, good, good healthy diet, all increase the density of your bones and then how long your bones will stay healthy. Now while osteoporosis and arthritis are obviously you know, 
big concerns for most people, there are more potential disorders of bones and joints. And then these disorders are classified by what causes them, such as are they congenital, are they degenerative, are they nutritional, are they tumors, are they traumas, are they due to infections, inflammations, and so on. So here are some common examples, such as uh, congenital disorders, ones that you are born with, such as scoliosis, lordosis, uh, cleft palate, all those are conditions that you are born with that you can't do anything about initially. Uh, degenerative, they get worse and worse as you get older, such as osteoporosis. A trauma disorder would be such as a bruise or a fracture. Uh, nutritional disorders will include uh, rickets, which is a lack of vitamin D, uh, scurvy, which is a lack of vitamin C. This is a, it's a brief table of some common uh, bone disorders. Uh, infections, uh, rheumatic fever, uh, viral arthritis, uh, inflammations include you know, arthritis and bursitis. Uh, traumas would include you know, ankle and foot injuries or hip injuries, uh, knee injuries, and so on. Next, we'll get into uh, some common skeletal disorders and then what their signs and symptoms are and how they may be treated. Uh, the first one, arthritis. It's the inflammation of a joint or of a synovial membrane. Uh, osteoarthritis is a common one. Uh, the etiology is the joint cartilage. It basically will wear out you know, through repetitive trauma or just natural aging. Uh, common signs and symptoms, uh, painful inflammation, and the wearing away of the cartilage in between the two, bone, two bones that form the joint. The way you would test for uh, osteoarthritis uh, diagnostically, you know, visual exam, imaging, uh, common ways to treat osteoarthritis, rest, uh, exercises, uh, pain relievers, analgesics, uh, anti-inflammatory meds, uh, steroid injections if needed, uh, surgical intervention if needed, such as a joint replacement. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, etiology, is autoimmune disease that will attack uh, your own connective tissue, especially the connective tissue uh, within joints. Uh, some common signs and symptoms, uh, stiffness, uh, swelling, uh, fluctuating pain within multiple joints, uh, inflammation of the synovial membrane, and uh, very pronounced uh, joint deformities. Uh, some common uh, diagnostic tests, visual exam, uh, imaging, and the antibody screening. Because remember, this is an autoimmune disorder. So there, are, there will be more antibodies present than there would for someone who has osteoarthritis. Uh, common treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, aspirins, uh, corticosteroids, uh, rest, range of motion exercises, uh, methotrexate, it's a common drug, and in very advanced cases, you may need surgical intervention. Uh, septic arthritis, the etiology, uh, this is an infection inside a joint uh, from penetrating a joint wound or a blood-borne uh, pathogen. The symptoms, uh, pain, swelling, the filling of joint with inflammatory exudates, uh, the destruction of joint and replacement of fibrous tissue with actual bone. Some diagnostic tests for septic arthritis, uh, imaging, uh, visual exams, uh, fluid culture, to see what kind of pathogen is present causing the septus. Uh, treatments, uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics is obviously the most common one you would use to treat septic arthritis. Uh, bursitis, the inflammation of the bursa. Uh, etiology, uh, repetitive motion, uh, strains, uh, congenital defects, uh, and rheumatic diseases. Right, the signs and symptoms of bursitis, uh, the pain on the motion, uh, which will limit the range of motion. They also will have inflammation and swelling at the infected area. The diagnostic test for this, uh, visual exam, imaging, uh, some common treatments for bursitis, uh, rest, the moist heat and cold therapy, uh, pain relievers, uh, corticosteroid injections at the site if needed, uh, draining of the fluid if needed, and uh, range of motion exercises are also common. Right, another common skeletal disorder, the cruciate ligament tears, is where you have a tear in one or more of the supporting ligaments of the knee, such as the MCL, ACL. Those are the medial cruciate ligament or the anterior cruciate ligament that are common for sports injuries. Uh, the etiology, this is trauma involving the leg when twisted or planted during a, a weight-bearing move, for example. And then the leg will receive anterior or a posterior blow, which will cause it to twist more. Some common signs and symptoms, uh, obviously uh, pain in the knee, 
a very uh, unstable knee joint and very uh, restricted mobility. Uh, some diagnostic tests for these, a uh, physical exam, especially uh, joint stability testing, radiologic exams such as an MRI. And the way you would treat this, uh, rest, uh, immobilizing the joint, and of course a surgical repair of the tears. Right. Uh, gout, uh, etiology is the it's a metabolic disease where uric acid uh, levels in the blood become too high because your body is not eliminating this acid quickly enough. So this will cause the uric acid to uh, form solid crystals and then it will, it will deposit those crystals within joints. Signs and symptoms. Excruciating pain at the affected joint such as uh, the big toe for example. Uh, tenderness and swelling at the affected joint. Uh, inflammation and heat along with that joint. At, at very advanced stages, it can also impact the kidneys. Some other uh, diagnostic tests, uh, visual exam, uh, blood testing uh, for excessive uric acid, and the way you would treat gout, uh, a restriction of uh, dietary protein, uh, moving to a, a low-fat uh, dairy products, and then rest and mobilization of the joint, uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, pain relievers, and some uh, drugs that will help to lower the levels of gout. And of course, uh, blood work to monitor the levels of uh, uric acid within the blood. Kyphosis, uh, the hunchback or the humpback. The etiology is the aging process or osteoporosis. Uh, signs and symptoms, the exaggerated curvature of the, of the upper back, the humpback. Uh, diagnostic test, visual exam, uh, imaging uh, treatments. This will uh, depend on the age and severity of the patient. It could include exercise, uh, electrical stimulation, uh, bracing, surgical repair, weight control. It just really depends on the person and how severe. Osteomalacia is the softening of the bone. Uh, etiology, uh, a decreased mineralization of bone due to a insufficient levels of vitamin D. Could be caused by improper diet, uh, lack of exposure to sunlight, uh, malabsorption of vitamin D in the diet. Uh, some signs and symptoms, uh, bone pain, uh, a loss of height, since your bones can't bear the extra height and extra weight, so you won't be as tall as you should be for your age. Uh, deformity of the weight-bearing bones, because they can't handle that weight, so they become more bowed and more twisted. Uh, diagnostic test, uh, bone scans, uh, visual exams, uh, and treatment will, will be to control uh, nutritional deficiencies. You know, more vitamin D, more exposure to vitamin D, and so on. Osteomyelitis. Uh, the etiology is the infection in the bone, often caused by a wound within the skin, such as uh, the bacterium uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, sudden pain, uh, heat, uh, swelling, uh, tenderness at the infected area, uh, a high fever plus chills. Uh, sometimes you get nausea or malaise. Some diagnostic tests, uh, visual exam, uh, the culture for the pathogen, Staph aureus. And treatment, of course, antibiotics, because it is a bacterial condition. And if needed, uh, surgical debridement. Osteoporosis, uh, etiology, a uh, decreased bone mass that can be caused by aging, uh, decreased mobility, uh, estrogen uh, deficient, such as in postmenopausal post women. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, decreasing bone density, uh, pain, uh, fractures, especially easy fractures that shouldn't happen when they, when they do. Uh, loss of height and uh, kyphosis, uh, diagnostic testing, uh, imaging, and uh, bone density testing uh, treatments. Uh, probably the best treatment is early prevention, including you know, adequate levels of calcium in the diet, not smoking, uh, limiting calcium or limiting caffeine uh, consumption, exercising more, uh, supplemental calcium, uh, vitamin D, and necessary uh, medications that will increase bone mass. Uh, plantar fasciitis, or runner's heel, as it's often called. Uh, etiology is the repetitive impact trauma on the heel. This will result in inflammation of the connective tissue on the bottom surface or the plantar surface of the foot. There are some predisposing factors to this, uh, including uh, if you have a high arch in your foot, or if you have flat feet, or shoes that have uh, poor support in them, if you have increased uh, body weight, or if you have a sudden increase in activity. Uh, signs. Uh, intermittent pain on the bottom of the foot, uh, diagnostic testing, uh, radiology exam, uh, treatments, uh, application of ice, uh, rest, 
uh, pain relievers, uh, padding the heel and your shoes, and if, if needed, no surgical intervention. Uh, rickets, uh, etiology is the lack of vitamin D uh, when you're a child, which will result in the impaired calcium absorption and bone calcification as you get older. The signs are going to be you know, very weak, very deformed bones. It's very common to get uh, a bowing in the legs because the bones aren't strong enough to hold or, or to bear the weight of that person. So instead of being a nice vertical shape to them, they are bowed because they just can't handle the stress. Some diagnostic tests, visual exam, radiological exams, uh, treatments, uh, dietary corrections uh, to increase the vitamin D levels, uh, receiving supplemental vitamin D, and then more exposure to sunlight, which will increase vitamin D production naturally. Uh, scoliosis, uh, sideways, left and right curvature of the spine. Uh, etiology, uh, this is a congenital, congenital defect, uh, also caused by trauma or poor posture and obesity. Uh, signs and symptoms, the, a clear lateral curvature of the spine, uh, fatigue, uh, sciatica, uh, pulmonary insufficiency also. Some diagnostic tests, visual exam, uh, radiological exams. Uh, treatment, again, will depend on the age of the person and how severe uh, the curvatures are. This could be uh, exercise, it could be bracing, it could be surgery, uh, it could be weight control. I see tendonitis, uh, inflammation of a tendon. The etiology, uh, repetitive movement, often occurs in conjunction with bursitis. Some common signs, uh, inflammation of the involved tendon and pain uh, during the movement of the involved area. Some diagnostic testing, uh, visual exams, radiological exams, some common treatments, rest, uh, pain relievers, uh, corticosteroid injections, cold and moist heat therapy. Now move on to uh, pharmacology corner. The analgesic creams, the pain relieving creams, contain a material called uh, capsaicin. This will be applied to uh, affected areas. You also have corticosteroid injections. These are injected right into the infected area. A corticosteroid is a class of steroid, which we'll talk about in a future video. Uh, pain medications, such as NSAIDs, and this stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so NSAID, NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, uh, naproxen. These will treat inflammation and also uh, treat pain. Uh, aspirins and acetaminophens also treat pain. Uh, methotrexate can treat rheumatoid arthritis. And there are new classes of immunosuppressants, such as uh, Rheumacade, uh, Humira, and Enbrel. There are uh, calcium supplements, such as calcium-based antacids, that will help increase uh, bone density. And a, a powerful medication called uh, alendronate that will also increase uh, bone density. Uh, vitamin D, this will improve your body's natural ability to absorb calcium. Uh, estrogen replacement therapy, especially for uh, postmenopausal women, does, does seem to improve bone density in women. But of course that will vary greatly on each individual woman's situation. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter on the skeletal system. And we will continue on with our next video on the muscular system.